Generalized anxiety disorder or GAD, what is it exactly? Well, you have to meet specific criteria as defined by the DSM 5TR, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual that psychiatrists, psychologists use to diagnose people. You have to meet specific criteria in order to have the diagnosis. It's not the same thing as just worrying or even just worrying a lot or what we call non pathological anxiety. And we're going to talk about those criteria right now. Welcome to Psych Talk. I'm Dr. Wenla. Here are the first three criteria that must be met in order to get a diagnosis, a medical diagnosis of GAD. Excessive anxiety and worry. Worry is defined as apprehensive expectation. More days than not. And it's worry related to typical activities like work, home, social, school performance, not out of the ordinary activities that would create tremendous anxiety in anyone. The individual finds it very difficult to control the worry. So even though they try to stop the thinking, tell themselves that it's out of proportion or it's unreasonable, they're unable to stop the sort of intrusive worry and concern and anxiety. The anxiety and the worry that are associated with GAD have to come with three of the following symptoms. And we're going to talk specifically about those symptoms in just a moment. The symptoms have to have been present for at least six months on more days than not. Number one, restlessness or feeling keyed up or on edge. Number two, being easily fatigued. People with GAD tend to feel tired most of the time, primarily because having that much anxiety takes a lot of energy. Number three, difficulty concentrating or your mind going blank. This is the sense of being in sort of a fog, unable to get things organized. Sometimes people will say they have trouble getting it together. Number four, irritability. Oftentimes there is persistent irritability that occurs, again, most days than not and over a long period of time. Number five, muscle tension. This can manifest as tension headaches, back pain, neck pain, or pain anywhere in the body, but oftentimes headaches and neck aches. Number six is sleep disturbance, and this can manifest in a variety of ways. Early insomnia, late insomnia, I have a video on terminal insomnia, which I will put in the description below. It can manifest as just feeling like your sleep is not good quality, like you're sort of restless, and when you wake up in the morning, you're still extremely tired. So those are the six criteria. In order to meet the diagnostic criteria for GAD, one must have at least three of six, and it has to have been present more days than not over a period of at least six months. So that's pretty specific. So what does this look like clinically? What do we really see? There are really kind of two facets to GAD, two pieces that you need to consider. One is the severity of the anxiety. So typically, the anxiety and the worry has an intensity and a duration or a frequency that's way out of proportion to whatever the event is, whatever it is that the person is worried about. So for example, if we are anxious about maybe something happening to our children, um, we're worried about a, a car accident or some disaster, it doesn't just kind of flip through your mind and then you can get you can sort of get rid of it. Instead, it stays and it's really overwhelming and it really affects your ability to concentrate or do your life. So it's constantly coming up almost like in an intrusive way. So one is the severity of the anxiety. The second piece of GAD that's important to consider is the constant worry. So it's really persistent. It's not just very severe, but it's happening most of the day, all day long. I'm worried about this or I'm worried about that. I cannot get relief from it. So the consistency of the worry and the severity of the anxiety are two things that you need to consider. So how do we further distinguish generalized anxiety disorder from just regular worrying or what we call non-pathological anxiety? There's several things to consider. 
First, normal anxiety or typical non-pathological anxiety is perceived by the person as normal. So we tend to think that's normal worry. That's something anybody would worry about. It doesn't feel overwhelming. With GAD, the anxiety feels overwhelming. It feels atypical and feels as if it is something bigger than what the person can control. Second, the worries associated with generalized anxiety disorder are so severe that they interfere with functioning. So they make it difficult to work. They make it difficult to enjoy social events. They make life very difficult. And third, there may also be associated physical symptoms with GAD. So things like nausea, dizziness, gastrointestinal complaints in general are very common. Headache can also occur. Typically, when you have non-pathological anxiety, you don't get the physical associations, the physical symptoms associated. A few facts associated with GAD that can be very helpful to be aware of. The prevalence in adults, in the adult population in the United States, is about 2.9%, close to 3%, which again is not insignificant. The lifetime risk for having some period of time in which a person is suffering from GAD is 9%. So that, again, not insignificant. GAD tends to be much more common in women and girls. It runs about twice as commonly in females as in males. The mean age of onset for generalized anxiety disorder is 35 years, which is much later than many other psychiatric illnesses. This is important because oftentimes a person may have no other psychiatric history. They don't have a history of depression or anxiety of any sort, anything, and yet here they are in young middle age presenting with lots of symptoms that qualify for the diagnosis of GAD. On the other hand, anxiety like this can also present in, in childhood. Often people are suffering with some level of worry, excessive worry, from their very early days. And there is also an increased association with things like depression, with panic disorder, and with substance abuse. In other words, you see those things more frequently in patients with GAD than you do in the typical population. And finally, some of the risk factors associated with the development of generalized anxiety disorder include having an anxious temperament, so just generally being a high-strung, more tense person, childhood adversity, so that can include a history of abuse, but can also include a history of very severe parenting techniques that include a lot of over-control or even an excessive amount of overprotection. And finally, there are genetic or physiological factors which play a very significant role. We know that anxiety and generalized anxiety specifically run in families. So that's it. That's a quick summary of generalized anxiety disorder. The most important points, I think, are that it is not the same thing as non-pathological worrying, non-pathological stress. GAD really represents a much more severe problem and something that tends to interfere with everyday functioning. So that's it for today. Please check out my videos on anxiety. A few of them are listed in the description below and also my playlist on anxiety disorders. If you like this video, remember to hit like and subscribe and the notification bell so you don't miss anything. And I'll see you next time.